Bob Lear is a lost township, tucked away in the trees, just a stone's throw from the road between Ullapool and Inverness at Inverlaw. Centuries of history lie buried and forgotten. In this series, with the help of Ullapool Museum, archaeologists and historical experts, we're bringing the people and stories of Balblair and Inverlaw back to life. Eight snapshots, reimagined moments in Highland history, which have, until recently, been hidden in plain sight. Episode 6, Ushgebeha, Whiskey. Hidden? Aye, well, it was my time. Oh, ach, and stoosh all that, But this is powerful stuff. You can see things that aren't even there or won't be for a long time to come. As a poet of the Southland has it, Oh, would some power the gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. Well, it's as long as nobody can see us now. <laughs> hmm. There we have a still. This tree's obviously fallen down. So oh, there's these stones here. Where the dog is, that's the end of it. Right. That's right oh, yeah. To here. Yeah. So they think this is the doorway, and this is the water collection, and she runs that way. Keep your voice down, won't you? Another sip, though. Just a, just a teeny one, and the Ushkabea clears the mist. So we think this here is the hearth. Here's Duncan Mackenzie, historian, gamekeeper, butcher. In these parts, you have to lend your hand to all the arts. I knew your forefathers well, Duncan Bean. Duncan's the man who's bringing Inverlaw, my homeland, back to life. Well, somebody needs to. It's no just the illicit still that's hidden. We've been hidden too long. The other fellow, Chris Dolan, he's called my writer. He's plucked me right out of his head. Ha, oh, Screever, why did you write me such a big bousy nose for, eh? You're no very good, are you, if you can't even write a nose? Let's have a wee listen in to them. So toward the end of the 18th century, the distilling of whisky on small scales became absolutely endemic. That's Darug Brat, an archaeologist. Fancies himself as an expert in whisky distilling. <laughs> we'll see if he knows half as much as I do. Realistically, absolutely everyone in the Highlands would have been involved e either as a producer, a consumer or a smuggler. I find it so fascinating to me, specifically because this is a women's industry. I'm Siobhan Beatson. I am the curator at Alto Museum. I am leading the research team for the Lost Envelope project and it is an unexpected women's industry. This is women and children who are dealing with this because it's women and children who are really up at the shillings. They're milking the cows, they're making the cheeses and this would have been also women doing this and I don't think that's entirely expected. It just makes women look more well-rounded in society instead of these two-dimensional figures. You're looking at proper 3D people with the wee side hustles on the side and I feel that that's a story that's never been told so that's why for me in particular telling a story of just how important the women were to this process is much more important than potentially even the process itself. Let me formally introduce myself. <clears throat> Grizel McCree, at your service. Wifey, Croft the Robal Blair in the parish of Inmalol, Loch Broom. The most beautiful country known to man or woman. I'm also, you'll have gathered, if you know a dafty, a maker of the water of life. But mind, shh. That's our track going out there. There's another track going out here. This track goes through between Ben Jerig and, and uh, Corrie Grant and comes out at Alkewish. The perfect illicit distilling site affords you secrecy and seclusion, but it's not remote in an abstract sense. To smuggle something successfully, you need to be able to take it away quickly. So really you're looking for sites that are hidden but expedient. What you absolutely need is a reliable supply of water. Often, especially as the old shielding grounds went out of use, people moved their distilling operations from the home, which is where they did it when it was legal, out to the shielding grounds. And that was an area of landscape that was remote from authority. They were familiar with it. 
it was connected to the landscape with a variety of routes and ways, and they almost always had a reliable source of water. So often if you're in an old shielding ground in the highlands, you won't be too far from unless it's still. There would be a total hub of the community. It wasn't an isolated little building way out in the outskirts. It was there, it was during the summer, there would be lots of people about, they'd be celebrating, they might be tasting it to see how wet and good it is. <laughs> With the whiskey stills in particular, probably late summer, kind of early autumn into the kind of mid-autumn. So you can kind of feel that warmth and heat of the nights with the whiskey and people partying and that general kind of jovial atmosphere around it at the same time. So we think this here is the hearth and this here is where the worm gear would be sitting. The illicit still at Inverlal is a unusually good example of what an illicit still should be. It has a really nicely preserved still hearth. It has very nice drainage. It has running water actually running into and through the site. It's very simple to make in terms of what's going into it. It's grains, malted grains, usually barley, but oats and other grains have been used in Scotland, and water and yeast. The process is fairly simple, but it does take time. So it takes anything from a few days to a week to ferment the wash or beer uh, that you then distill into whiskey. That means that it would, to be time efficient, people would have moved stills between different distilling sites. So a still used it in Valo could have been used in several uh, across the area. Presumably it was drunk young. Yeah. They didn't, they they didn't do the ageing or anything like that. No. no, there was no barrels in no. that to the ageing. In a site like the site at Inverlal, there are fairly small sites. They're five or six metres by two or three metres. But the scale of production was actually quite large. So I've found records of seizures at still sites that document the seizure of over 200 gallons of wash at a time. That would have been enough assuming a fairly low yield of about 7% to make up to 100 bottles of whisky. Here's the finished produce, a bottle of Inverlal's finest. Sweet, thanks to the douce waters of this mountain stream. Kind of chewy, a lovely body to it, as my body says to me of a night. <laughs> Ooh, this nectar, not called the water of life for nothing. Is in demands for miles and fathoms afar. <gasps> no wonder. Whiskey really began to change in its character at the end of the 18th century, uh, where it became more like the sort of southern spirits that we're familiar with, things like brandy. Before that, it was much more of a vernacular drink, and it was probably more akin to a Scandinavian aquavit. Aquavita is what it used to be called, the water of life, and that's the root of its Gallic name as well, Ushkaba. If there was any smoke or smells or sounds, they would be able to be covered up by the general working din of the environment they were in. They were designed to be hidden in plain sight. They went to quite extraordinary measures to keep these stills secret, and that's reflected in the architecture that uh, we see, or the archaeology that we see, where they really can be nothing more than a, a low stone wall that would have been covered with a turf roof or with a, a heather thatching. They haven't dug anything out. They've used a dip that was already there. They have built up a little bit of a wall around it just to enclose it a bit. There'll be heather on the top. And when you're up standing in front of it, unless you specifically knew it was there, you would not be able to see it, even from about two or three feet. There were extensive networks set up for signalling so people would know when the gauges were arriving. And yeah, the whole community was in on it. So let's set the scene. You've got kids running, screaming, bawling. You've got cows mowing their heads off. You've got dogs barking. You've got smoke everywhere. And up here is a wee wisp of smoke coming out. Everyone's watching for everyone else, of course. So when, the, when that was done, the barley that's been in there comes out as draft. That gets taken down, the cows scoff it. Mm -hmm. So the evidence is gone. Up until I think it's 1780, perfectly legal to have small scale skills. So that's how we can nail our still down quite narrowly down because ours is hidden. So you were allowed to distill up to, I think, 40 gallons of whiskey, perfectly legally. Um, so it was for community use, people paid rents with it, paid other traders, they sold it on the drove roads, absolutely perfectly legal for community use. The tax laws in 1780 changed, which meant that you were no longer allowed to do small scale distilling, which meant that they had to go underground. 
the main enforcers of the law in the Highlands were the landlords who benefited from getting rent from their tenants. So they had a vested interest in not enforcing the laws too harshly. Illicit. <laughs> the laird still makes a fair sum out of it. Still, it has to be hidden. Mackenzie of Cool gets the profit, and we get the blame and the jail. Still, we have our ways. And we've got local history, one specific story about how a local witch mustered a fog to get the excisemen lost and the excisemen that were coming from Ullapool ended up in Elfin instead of down at the still and given the the distillers and the still time to be and taken to bits and moved before they eventually realised where they were lost and then made their way back to the correct place. What do you make of that writer? Spells and incantations. It's a deep wild world we live in from what I can see of yours well he's a bit dull and well eh, matter of fact a magic cloud I put in you house of the Yushka bear, and poof it disappears well it seems to after a few drams making and smuggling illicit whiskey was vital for the survival of Highland communities. In some ways it was a lifeline, but it was also another route for alienation. The money that a illicit distiller made, it was a fairly significant amount, but much of that would have gone to the smugglers who would have sold the whiskey on and would have paid the illicit distiller a lower price for it. And a lot of the remaining money would have gone to the landlord. In fact, landlords were able to charge about three times the amount of rent when they were letting people distill illicitly on the land than they would have been otherwise, which is why they often went to such lengths to actually protect distillers on their land. We know from the records that the landlord for Inverlaw and for our still, George Stuart Mackenzie, didn't have the same opinion. He's actively said, written in books, written in newspaper, that he will not prosecute his tenants. One of the strategies he proposed was that they stop looking for illicit distillers entirely and they only try to apprehend smugglers on the road. But it's a really interesting tactic because actually what it meant was that by the time the smugglers were uh, apprehended on the road with their wares, they had already bought the whiskey from the distillers in the hills who were George's tenants. So he was able to appear to be being a good citizen and a politician, but actually he was really extracting his pound of flesh from his tenants. Sir George Stuart Mackenzie. Seventh Baronet of Cool. Oh, oh, a grand man, all right. Ha, me cheeing a newest, Anisha. Ha, hey, Roddy, I'm coming down now. <laughs> Shagruary. Oh, don't get me started on our Stuart Geordie lad. There's more rumours about him than you could shake a lamb's tail at. Aye. There me drama, Nusha Hookit. Aye, I'll bring a dram for you. Well, maybe this isn't the time to let my tongue roll free around the subject of our laird. You'll be hearing plenty more about him. Grizel McCray, mind. Don't you forget me. Don't forget any of us. We were people just like you. With a long and dramatic tale to tell. Tell us well now, writer, and learn how to write the nose, will ye? Look at the state of this one. Ooh, I hope you're as bad at writing hangovers. Grizel. Zell McCree. In Hidden in Plain Sight, the experts were Duncan Mackenzie, Darach Bratt and Siobhan Beetson. The actor was Fiona MacDonald and the writer was Chris Dolan. Writer! Writer! You seen this state he's written me into? Disgrace so it is! Uta! Uta! And five shivin stars can't describe me. Hidden in Plain Sight was produced by Adventurous Audio Limited and made possible thanks to the support of the Audio Content Fund.